demolish the little fat with this. Oh, we're coming. We're coming. <laughs> okay. Here we are on Saturday, 5th of May 2012, for a perfect heart by my own team. And joining us on the couch today is no other than Peter Alps. Now, Peter's career spanning, spans over 35 years. Um, his photography artwork has found its way into private and public collections in Australia and overseas, including the National Gallery of Australia, the Powerhouse Museum of Sydney, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Sydney and the New South Wales Parliament. His work is extensive and it focuses mainly on um, his latest work from aerial shots uh, from above. He's mixed it with many different forms of photography and we're glad to welcome Peter Alves. How are you, Pete? Good, thanks, Dan. It's nice great to uh, have you here because, firstly, um, your exhibition is featured as part of the Head On Photo Festival, but it was also um, extended specifically. Um, tell us about the Green Desert. The Green Desert exhibition uh, is a series of uh, lovely aerial photographs that uh, I've taken over the past three and a half years around Lake Eyre and, and deserts, uh, desert regions around Lake Eyre, which are home to the uh, Arabana and Uluraka people. Uh, over those years, I've, I've got to know uh, the uh, traditional owners uh, who uh, are going to have a, a settlement with uh, uh, like the federal court uh, very soon, in, in a few weeks, which we can talk about a bit later. Uh, so yeah, the, yeah, the pictures uh, represent uh, the changing face of, uh, of Australia's interior, specifically Lake Eyre, which uh, the basin alone is 10,000 square kilometres um, that you know, most people will be aware is generally a, a dry salt pan, uh, which becomes uh, a very different place uh, once it's charged uh, with uh, trillions and trillions of litres of water, which sometimes take you know, months to travel from um, the top end. Uh, and over the years, since uh, at least since uh, White Settlement, uh, we've only ever had one filling uh, you know, in, in a, a every decade or so where it's you know, a bit of water. Uh, in 1974, there was a significant flooding which filled um, Lake Eyre. Since then, it hasn't really happened. So this this recent event um, is has been quite incredible and more more re uh, relevant uh, fact of, of this recent flooding is that uh, in the past it's only ever happened for one season even in 74 when it, the water levels were 15 metres it only, uh, it only lasted for the season uh, it's a sign of, of what may be ahead in terms of climate change we're now looking at the fourth year and going into the fifth year where water is still in the south lake and north lake the lake, the north of the lake air uh, something that we have never experienced or seen in, since White Settlement. I'm certain that it may have occurred during the during the Aboriginals' uh, uh, 40,000 year occupation, but of course, you know, we don't have any, any record of that. So uh, I think uh, it's interesting. I certainly wasn't prepared for something like that uh, from a geological and climatic point of view. Um, and now with the recent um, announcement from the federal government about the handover of, of Lake Eyre, it's been a, uh, all together a pretty incredible few years. What impact do you think specifically um, this climate shift is having on the local indigenous Aboriginal population? How do you think it's affecting them? Well, I, I think uh, from a climatic point of view, you know, they're, uh, they're interested in, in what these changes mean. Uh, I suppose in some ways, ironically, it's had a kind of a positive uh, aspect to uh, to their lives because from uh, from an international and national point of view, is, uh, the, the water being in, in the basin for multiple seasons has given people the opportunity to to go and, and see it and, and, uh, and experience it for themselves. Uh, that's always been in, in, without any any cultural. Um, so, you know, without very much cultural, uh, um, cross-cultural education. Whereas nowadays, um, you know, at least moving forward, uh, hopefully the, the um, presence of the Indigenous people uh, in a way to educate uh, people, uh, the public, international public as well as the national public, that go out to see you know, this extraordinary place 
uh, just to, to let them in and see some of uh, their history and their culture and uh, so that they actually learn about uh, the people that used to live in, in, uh, in around Lake Air. So it's, uh, it's great that uh, you know these, these climatic events have brought a lot of attention to the place uh, specifically at this time because we're about to get all the native titles. So it, it, it's almost like the climate and, and historic events are converging to this one point where we all end up being not only aware of an uh, extraordinarily mysterious and interesting place, but at the same time become aware of the occupants that have been there for 50,000 years. Very significant, Peter. Um, just tell us about the native title and what it's going to um, bring to the local Aboriginal population there. Uh, the native title uh, uh, being awarded to the Uluwak Arabana Association, uh, something which they've been um, in the federal court, uh, we've claimed to be with the federal court now for over a decade. It's been uh, very difficult for them um, to, to try to get this through for various reasons, uh, as, and very often is the case with, with uh, the native title claims. I've to, to show proof of, of uh, the lineage and so forth. Often these records don't exist in any, in any form because they don't have anything written and so forth. Um, so from a, from a legal point of view, of course, they, you know, it's been very, very difficult for them. So to get this uh, native title awarded, of course, is an enormous um, achievement to, to the to the Arabana people, specifically uh, Aaron Stewart, who's the chair of the Arabana, who's been the, the leader in, in Shamel, to all, the, the, all of these, uh, uh, this, these challenges to, to the federal, uh, the federal government sign up with them, um, to try and f refute the, their claim. Uh, it's, I think, fantastic news that finally the federal government has recognised that them as traditional owners, and on the 22nd of May uh, this year, 2012, um, the ceremony for the handover of 79,000 square kilometres of uh, the South Australia, which includes Lake Air um, and many, many other important areas. Uh, Lake Air, of course, being not just uh, you know, a, a pretty place for us, as we see, but an incredibly important cultural place for the you know, Arabana people, a um, spiritual place for them, it's almost like being necklace, if you like. Um, so to, to have uh, that event um, in, you know, in my lifetime, in everyone's lifetime, especially, especially during this period where it's been three, four years, I think there's a there's a synchronicity where you know the land is actually responding to this, this, this great event. I, I think in the years ahead, people will look back at this time and, and, and wonder how it was that the world's focus, there was attention, was brought uh, to Lake Air because it's this you know, mystery of the desert sea, and all of a sudden, while everyone's attention is on it this incredible historic Aboriginal, you know, handover occurs. So for me, it, it symbolises a synergy between the Aboriginal people and the land, and thankfully, you know, the, the paperwork, if you like, is, is actually followed on that as well. Yes, yes, we've been rolling all that time. Oh, great. Oh, great. The We're the outtakes, we'll make the intakes, the intakes. Like, like oh, that in Sydney, you can watch things about people. <laughs> Well, you know, I think um, it would be like to... It's going straight. ATO have their direct feed. <laughs> <laughs> Again? Again, yeah. yes. They've got traditions to maintain, too. <laughs> oh, well, well. Okay, so, right. Now, you're going to introduce oh, the poet of yeah. choice. Oh, yes. Right. And um, the poem you're going to read. Uh, yes, I am, thanks. Thank you. Uh, and, and I'd like to introduce a poet uh, who a lot of people might not know of, uh, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the great Australian poets, Henry Barkoff Boak, and his surname is uh, B O, what is that? B O A K E, which you know that. Uh, and uh, Henry has a rather uh, sad uh, story um, in his life, so to speak. Um, he actually died uh, his own hand, very young, hung himself by his own stockwhip on the four shores of Sydney, broken hearted. Uh, young man, uh, is important to be to, 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 to say that uh, he is the originator of the story that spawned the poem by Banjo Patterson, the man from Snowy River. And uh, a lot of uh, chatter has gone around about that. 
and uh, it had to do with uh, him uh, spending some time on a certain property of Rosebank Rosebank uh, in the Snowy Mountains, uh, spending some time with a young fellow named Mackenzie, who chased down a, a bunch of uh, beautiful brumbies that uh, they were trying to get a hold of. Uh, this young fellow was an incredible horseman. Anyway, one of the brumbies um, trying to get away ended up uh, headlong into a huge ground of boulder. Uh, and uh, was killed instantly, and uh, his, the remains of this, uh, this horse carcass so uh, lay there for years. And the story got out about this young fellow and friends who managed to chase these grumpies through this incredibly steep rocky terrain in the Snowy Mountains. Uh, and it became uh, a bit of a legend, and it was passed on, and of course the uh, hub of all these stories is usually the pub, as we are right here. And uh, it, uh, it went through uh, along the ways, and certainly uh, the, the, the Braidwood, uh, uh, the pub, the loaded dog at the Braidwood pub uh, was uh, one place where the, a lot of uh, people stayed uh, and stopped in uh, on the way in or out of the, uh, the Sinai Mountains. Uh, and uh, it was said that Banjo Patterson actually, who often frequented this, this place, and of course spent some time down there as well, uh, heard about this young fellow Mackenzie and so forth. Uh, and then penned this, this poem, the, the, the man from Snow River, his poem, the man from Snow River. Uh, but the original story was um, passed on uh, by uh, Barcroft Boak, uh, who, never really, who had a little bit about that sort of stuff, but, uh, the, uh, the, the events, but not really quite the way the banjo did. In any case, it doesn't quite really matter who, where that, you know, the, 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 the poem, the man from Snow River, is certainly uh, one of the most iconic poems in, in Australian literature. And so, uh, it's just sort of interesting to uh, throw that little bit of a side story in about you know, where it may have come from. Um, today I would like to probably, uh, I'd like to read uh, a verse from uh, Alpha Folk's most uh, famous poem um, and the title uh, of uh, the published posthumously printed book in 1896 called Where the Dead Men Lie. And I'll just wait for a moment until these people in the background stop screaming at me. <laughs> before I actually begin. <laughs> so yes, uh, so, uh, a verse from uh, Barcroft Boats, Where the Dead Men Lie. Out on the waste of the Never Never, that's where the dead men lie. There where the heat waves dance forever, that's where the dead men lie. There where the, ooh, there where the heat waves dance forever, I said that. That's where they lie. That's, that's, that's where the Earth's love sons are keeping. Endless thrice, not wild winds sweeping. Feverish pinions can wake their sleeping out where the dead men lie. Thank you very much for joining us here at Corridor for prototype file number 10. It's been an absolute passionate pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great to be here as well. Thank you. Last night, I've been raving to everybody. <laughs> uh, and I was like, what, coincidentally, or just? No, I didn't know that you didn't know you were the artist. Uh, no, I saw Pete earlier today. I basically said, I've actually seen him as an artist. He's been here last night, and there's a mate, you know, I didn't see much of anything. Good, this is good. But he's back. Um, and then I saw this, I said, must have been my son's name. Yeah, what was the traditional name? Yeah, what was the traditional name again? Kati Thundra. Kati Thundra? Kati Thundra. That's cool. Kati Thundra. It's, it's it's, it's nice almost like uh, Hindi. It sounds like Hindi. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Tundra. Yes, you know, like, so, uh, is a, is, is a, a Such word. Yeah, Bundubanta is a word that they give to a great body of water or uh -huh. something like a lake or whatever it is.